So back in, I guess, uh, August of 2016, I was doing a bunch of demos, new demos for the lessons, or at least new at the time. And uh, I did a demo of a scorpion that I kind of regretted because one of the things that I did in that demo was I very blatantly undermined the, the uh, solidity of one of my constructional forms, and I just kind of went along with it. At the time, I wasn't quite as hardline about respecting the solidity of those forms as I am now because I'm continually learning from how I'm teaching other people. So these are things that I may already kind of have in mind, but as you teach people, your own methodology kind of becomes cemented in certain ways. And I'm sure in the future, I'll be making other revisions to the way I'm doing things now. But currently, I... I just have certain uh, demos that I've decided really don't line up with the way I want to teach things now. So this one will be another Scorpion demo where I'm kind of uh, covering what I taught there, but in a, in a way that matches my current principles. So we'll be drawing this ugly ass Scorpion, and frankly I hate looking at it. So hopefully you guys hate looking at it too. So I'm there's a lot going on in this in this reference image uh, it's there's just so much it can be quite difficult to figure out where to start and generally I find the easiest place to start is just by putting a ball for the head most things will benefit from uh, having a ball as a starting point even if their head is not a ball you can usually build on top of it to create the rest of their head the next thing that really does jump out at me, which is uh, quite a complex form here, is the full torso of this scorpion. It's the thorax and abdomen combined, and like, uh, I guess, beetles and uh, most, some spiders, most spiders, I'm not sure, uh, but like a lot of uh, creatures, you'll see them kind of merge together. So we will you have to find a way to kind of tackle the fact that this this torso has a very clear curve to it like this it's kind of arcing up so we cannot really capture it too well with an organic kind of sausage form we can certainly try to but the way that I did it previously in my last demo was I just put another kind of uh, organic form and then I just kind of figured it out from there, but that's not really the approach that we want to use because if you put down this kind of organic form and then kind of undermine it, it's really going to give a pretty steady blow to your overall, overall construction. Uh, it, it's not necessarily something that you shouldn't ever do. There's, there's nothing like quite so hard and fast, but it is a dangerous and risky situation that generally you would like to avoid if you can. So in this case, we're going to construct this scorpion from a boxier starting point. So I am creating a... Now, it's not going to be a box exactly. It's going to be boxy in that it's going to have clear planes. We've got this sort of... Uh, it's got a very clear top plane, a sort of... This area here is another plane, and then there's the side. So we'll see what we can do about that. And notice how the scorpion's body does taper as it comes back. So we've got this kind of box arrangement. And it does at least simplify some things. So the next thing I'm going to do is figure out this tail. It's, again, quite complicated. So my first instinct is to flesh out how that whole tail configuration flows through space kind of comes to a point with a ball here and that little stinger I'm so glad I live in Canada where we don't have scorpions
Now you'll notice that my tail configuration does not perfectly match this because as I've always said, I'm not aiming to perfectly reproduce this photograph here. I'm really just trying to learn from it and trying to reconstruct a scorpion, not necessarily this individual. What I am doing though is I'm counting the number of components that there are so at least that matches because in many ways I believe scorpions have a set number of segments like even if you look at their shells I believe there's uh, one two three four five six seven segments then the the plate covering the head so uh, we'll see what I can do with this So if there's going to be seven plus the head plate, I do want to mark those out so that I don't accidentally put too many or too few. The best way to do that is to put non-committal marks. So these first two are quite close together. The next one is a little bit further out. And these are kind of e evenly spaced. Alright, I kind of messed that up a little bit. The great thing about using little dots is that you're not, if you decide to ignore them, it's not that big of a deal. There's not a huge commitment there. I may have made this torso a little bit too long, so I kind of have to compensate for it. We'll see how I can make this work. Uh, the segmentation of the scorpion is actually very useful because it gives us a lot of free natural contour lines that we can take advantage of. So the first thing here that I want to do, I always say first thing even though I'm on like the 12th step, I want to build out this plate that covers the head. While it is a complicated form, I can basically run along the surfaces that I know exist as long as I'm aware of how they actually work in 3D space and how they sit in relation to each other. Because if you're not really aware of all of these surfaces, you are just going to end up drawing a random form. So you really do have to think it through. And always when you are segmenting anything, be aware of how it impacts the silhouette. You've got these very small kind of subtle bumps on the silhouette here, and they really work to sell the idea that this form, that this object is heavily segmented. I'm not actually really sure what's going on here. Ideally, one would go and look close-up pictures of a scorpion's head. I don't really want to do that right now because scorpions can go straight to hell. So I'm just kind of winging it there. I don't recommend that you do, but I love you guys, but I don't love you enough to look at a scorpion's face straight on. Another very useful uh, tool when you're drawing really any insect or any animal, any anything that is kind of symmetrical throughout its length uh, is to figure out where its center line is going to be flowing. So I'm taking a center line all the way down from the tail. The center line really helps us stay kind of grounded in our construction because it's very easy to lose track of which side of the center you're on. So this helps us kind of keep track of that. So now I'm going to flesh out the rest of the segmentation. Remember that all of these segments are still solid forms. We are not, this is not detail. This is thoroughly aware of how everything exists in 3D space. It's easy to get caught up in, you know, just drawing what you see and not thinking about how uh, all of it works in three dimensions. 
You need to keep reminding yourself that we are still dealing in construction right now. None of this is just superfluous detail work. A good construction is still 100% identifiable as what you've tried to create. You do not need to rely on any sort of details to make something look like what it is. Notice how I, I have this curve on the back, but as soon as I start heading towards the side plane, my angle changes, so I've got one plane here and a plane here. Always be aware of how your form breaks down into multiple planes. Also be aware of how your segmentation kind of layers. I believe it's primarily with the f more forward the plate is, the more, uh, I mean, the, uh, the rear plates kind of layer underneath the forward plates, basically. So you can see that this one is on top of this one, and this one's tucking in, sort of. I got it right. So this box form is definitely too tall. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to adjust it, but I'm going to adjust it in a way where I actually understand how the results sit in 3D space. So I am going to apply a cut here, but I'm going to bend it along my planes. So just similar to how you do the form intersections where you're cutting along the planes, here I know that I'm still running along the surface of this 3D form. So if I had to, I could tell you what the resulting cut piece, actually how it sits in 3D space. So I'm aware of how all of it occupies space. I don't, I'm not just tossing something aside without thinking about it. Also notice that under this uh, the shell on the head, or the, the plating on the head, there is this weird kind of like, I don't know if it's muscle or fat or what it is, but there is something lining those joints, so we don't want to forget about that. God, this whole thing is disgusting. For now, I'm going to leave the the, uh, the segmentation of the underside until I've actually figured out where the legs are going to go. Ugh. So usually when I'm laying out my legs, I'm going to flesh out a little circle where I believe they're connecting to. So this one seems to be tucked in back here somewhere. Then this big ass arm is coming up from the head, it seems. Maybe it's a pedipalp rather than a leg because they do already have a, 
eight legs. Uh, you can't actually see them all here. You only see three. But before you approach these kinds of constructions, you should be aware of. Uh, what did I just do? You should be aware of the basic makeup of your animal. Just because you cannot see the fourth leg, you can glimpse a little bit of it here, does not mean that it doesn't exist. So you don't want to accidentally draw a uh, scorpion with just three pairs of legs. All right, so. So my leg kind of comes out here and there's a segment here and it kind of arcs back around like this. So it's kind of like this, this, and then this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw sausages for these segments because I, I like the way that sausages flow. They are quite directional. And I usually do this for, with most insects, if not all of them. So as opposed to, say, a, uh, a stretched ball, which tends to have, it, it never kind of straightens out through its width. It's always kind of like swelling out and then tapering back in. Whereas your sausage is going to have a pretty consistent width throughout, and then it tapers in as it reaches the ends. So a sausage can be quite good for these kinds of gestural constructions. And it's very easy to create a sausage between two uh, ellipses, or two circles. But keep in mind that there is more to these actual segments than than just the sausages, so you are going to end up breaking them down a little bit more later on to kind of capture that those forms that you actually see. When it comes to observation, one thing that you can keep an eye on is uh, the vertical alignment of things. My construction has already kind of deviated quite a bit from this, just because I haven't really been matching up all of my measurements because I've been more focused on construction. But in certain cases, you can keep an eye on, say you're looking at this joint here, you can see which uh, part of the segmentation it lines up with and that can give you a good visual cue. But unfortunately, I'm too far gone to be able to rely on that. It's basically the Old West here. This guy has some really big four claws. 
this is essentially where the construction kind of gets a little bit too cluttered. There's not a whole lot you can do about it at this, at this point. When you've got these big kind of bulbous forms, don't forget to kind of flesh out those volumes so even you know how to work with them. It's easy to get a little bit lost. If you're building your chains like this from ball to ball, or uh, not chains, your limbs like this from ball to ball, it's a little bit easier to handle the sort of uh, foreshortening that we end up having to deal with sometimes. If ever you end up drawing these kinds of arbitrary extrusions, always flesh out your contours to figure out how the forms intersect with each other and how they occupy space. Because otherwise you're just gonna end up with floating shapes and those end up not kind of maintaining their own solidity. All right, so let's see what I can do about this here. There's some interesting little like casings around the uh, the tail. Unfortunately, I've got this part of the tail kind of buried in here, so I kind of lost this nice little uh, cut here where you've got the segmentation so that they can uh, the tail can actually move around. It's nicely articulated. Those are the kinds of details that you really want to catch because they uh, they really make the whole the scorpion itself, which is very heavily armored, it allows it to move around. That's actually something that you see a lot in armor, like medieval armor, where you wouldn't think that they would be able to move around a lot, but they actually can because they've got the same kind of articulated joints as you'd see in a scorpion. And of course, every little bit of uh, breakdown, every line that I'm adding wraps around the forms that I know exist. So I'm never drawing a straight line that cuts and uh, ignores the contour of the form. I'm always wrapping things around. So always keep an eye on that. And of course here, there's a very strong plane cut here. So I definitely wanna take advantage of that.
Always remember that cast shadows are certainly your friends when it comes to separating out forms. So the, uh, the segmentation itself can be very easy to break down and clarify when you're setting up these shadows correctly. And of course, we're not really concerned with how the light is actually hitting this form. We're just concerned with how are we going to separate them out, uh, separate these different plates and these different forms out from each other. So it's not really a matter of how we're rendering light and shadow, it's really just using it as a tool. kind of leveraging some of those contour curves here where I know that these forms are kind of not necessarily standing up super well on their own This little thing here is kind of matching up with this edge that I've got here. I don't want to put a solid line across because that's going to end up feeling too stiff. So instead I'm just kind of conveying the, uh, the gloss and that little sheen that you get on that side of the, uh, the shell or the exoskeleton. It's actually more of an experiment because I'm not sure if that's going to work really well, but as I've said in the past, always be bold with your decisions. Don't be afraid to kind of do something a little different. It may not work out well, but if it does, it's going to pay out. And of course, that's how we learn what does and doesn't work. I'm really identifying like these little ridges and bumps that they've got on the, uh, the, sh the pincer shell there. I'm trying to identify the different kinds of uh, bumps and irregularities I've got on there, uh, various parts of its body. At this point, I'm not really super interested in these legs that are kind of far off. Just fleshing them out as vaguely as possible. Just because this construction is already very complicated, usually I would actually explore just what lies on the other side and where they're connecting to the body. Like this. Uh, but in this case, it's a very, with so many legs, it's just, very difficult to manage. This video has definitely run on too long, so I'm going to try and cut it short soon. You guys have basically seen the gist of how I've been tackling this, particularly 
challenging subject matter with its awkward form and how I cut this boxy form while continuing to understand how it sits in space, like taking a box and cutting it in two along its planes. Saying that this is now my new box. The one thing that I do love about the scorpion is just how heavily segmented and armored it is. If you were fighting against something like 10 times life size, I don't know, 20, 30 times life size, it would be terrifying. I mean, it's terrifying enough as it is, but it's uh, it would be a lot to go up against because how would you even cut through all of its all of these layers of armor? And of course, they are quite the plates themselves are rather thick, so I'm trying to uh, notice how I've got this little extra, my line, my contour curves right there kind of dip down like this to show the thickness in this area. Little suggestions like that can really go a long way. But at this point it's really just noodling. The last thing that I actually want to discuss about this particular scorpion, and I'm going to move my reference out of the way for this, is the shadow shape that I always use, like the kind of uh, cast shadow shape that I lay on the ground underneath my insects. It's really just kind of a sort of approximation of, well, I think this tail form would lay down like that and cast a shadow that kind of looks sort of like this. I always make sure that my the tips of the shadow kind of reach the point where the feet touch the ground. This shadow shape is essentially just a very useful tool for conveying, for making the, uh, the object seem more grounded. Don't guess, I mean, well no, you are guessing as far as where the shadow would fall, but I don't want you to be random. I want you to be intentional with every line that you put down and how it's gonna fall on, on the ground. Try and use your better judgment, but in general, like, I mean, it doesn't, it's not going to be a big deal if it's way off, just to make it vaguely believable. And what this helps to do is just ground your construction so that it's actually sitting on a uh, plane, it's not floating in space. And it especially helps if, if the line is a little bit thinner than the rest of your construction lines, or at least the rest of your major lines. So you can add just a touch of weight to the other ones defining the silhouette of your form. Especially when you've got so much going on, it can help to kind of distinguish them a little bit. Anyway, in essence, that's basically how I would tackle this kind of scorpion. Um, turned out okay, it didn't turn out super great, um, but it's a complicated Thing to tackle. I do recommend that you try a scorpion at least uh, as one of your drawings. Um, they can be quite the puzzle to try and figure out and it's definitely worth a try. Even if you think that you're, it's not going to come out well, I mean that doesn't matter. That's not why we're drawing these things. We're drawing them to learn from, from the challenges and it's definitely a worthwhile challenge. Now that said, it would be a great idea for me to set up like, I don't know what, 50 scorpion challenge, but I'd never do that because I hate these goddamn things and I would not wish that on my worst enemy. Scorpions are...
horrible. They're worse than spiders, and I hate spiders too. So I'm going to call this video, and I hope it did help uh, clarify what I kind of screwed up on on the other scorpion demo from almost a year and a half ago. Thanks for watching.